Hello, everybody. LU factorization again. We're stuck in a time loop. Now, this is the second lecture on LU factorization. We will cover some of the stuff we talked about, but we will also talk about LU factorization with row permutation with is everything you need to factorize any matrix. So unlike what I told you last time, LU actually works for any matrix. It can, it can be singular, it can be rectangular, and it is a very general algorithm. So we talked about a second way of multiplying two matrices. And that was just taking the column of the first matrix, multiplying it with the row, the corresponding row of the second matrix, and summing over all multiplications. So that would give us the same result as the first method that is the standard way of multiplying matrices. So it seemed a little more complicated, but after probably solving a few examples, you should feel comfortable with this too. For example, we have matrices A and B, and we want to multiply them by summing over column times rows. So we partition A into two columns. That's our first matrix. We want to calculate A times B. And we partition B into rows. And what we need to do, we need to sum over K. K here is two. K was number of columns of the first matrix or the number of rows of the second matrix. That must be the same so we can do matrix multiplication. Now what all we need to do, we need to multiply first column times the first row plus the second column times the second row. If there would be a third column and row, we would continue. Each of them will give us a matrix. We add them up, and this would give us exactly the same result as the standard matrix multiplication that would be based on rows of the first matrix times columns of the second matrix. Now the reason we learned this in most courses, they don't teach you this, because we can build a nice story how this way of understanding matrix multiplication will lead to LU factorization. And LU factorization, you already know that we have a lot of motivations why we need LU factorization. One of them was for turning the problem into a lower and upper triangular system so we can solve it. In the next lecture, you will see that we can use LU to calculate the determinant of any matrix of any size. That will give us a very easy way to do that. On top of that, um, we can also calculate the inverse of any matrix with LU. So a lot of um, opportunities will be available once we can calculate the LU factorization of a matrix. So the name uh, we came up with, we called it peeling the onion. We're going to go layer by, la by layer to eliminate co columns and rows of matrices. So the question is, given a matrix, let's make it a game, like a puzzle. I give you a matrix. Find a way, find a column and row. Once you multiply them and subtract them from the matrix, you can zero out, uh, for example, the first column and first row of the matrix. That's just a puzzle, right? Like a math game with math. In other words, I give you a matrix such as M. Now the puzzle here we want to solve is that give me what C and R such that 
c as a column vector times rho as a uh, r as a row vector. When we multiply and subtract from m, it makes all the elements on the first column and first row zero. This means, asterisk means, there's going to be some numbers, not the original numbers, but we don't care. It doesn't matter what the specific values we will see here. It will be just, just some numbers. Now, what would be your first idea? We saw it last time. To come up with a solution for this puzzle. <clears throat> so, the trick that people have discovered is that you can take the first column of the matrix, same matrix. First time, we want to zero out the first column and the first row. Take the first column and divide it by the first diagonal element, which we called it pivot last time. That was our, you don't have to give it a name, but the mathematical name for it is pivot. We divide it by two, which always makes the first element, if it's the first time, second, if it's the second time, makes it one. So this will give you a C matrix. And take the original row, and the question is if this works, right? And we already know it works, because we tried it last time. So take the first column, divide it by the first diagonal element, multiply it by the first row without changing the row. See what you get. We get the matrix, and interestingly, it is reproducing exactly the numbers we need on the first column and the first row. Again, we do not care. We, these, these are asterisks. We get some numbers here. Sounds like it, it's working, and this is the first layer of the puzzle. It, it's, this will allow us to eliminate, um, you can call it eliminating a variable, but we're really here eliminating a row and column. Now when we do that, and when we subtract C times R from M, we successfully solved that problem of how to zero out a row and a column at the same time. So that's really the trick. It's like a game. And it turns out that that's one solution to it. So essentially, we take a three by three matrix, we do this trick, and then we are left with a two by two matrix because anything else around it is zero. So we are one dimension lower. Can we normalize the row vector instead of column? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Try. <laughs> but remember, because the matrix, uh, the reason I don't know, because the matrix multiplication, if you remember, is non-commutative, right? It is not as simple as you change one, and you get the same answer, because the multiplication doesn't preserve um, the order, right? We can try. I'm sure you can find a way that instead of diagonal of the L to be normalized, diagonal of U is normalized, right? In fact, you can do that. You can, so L U that we teach you is, there is also a version called L D U, where L and U are lower and upper triangular, but D is a diagonal. So all the Di elements on diagonal of L and U are one, right? D is just some bunch of values. Now, of course, you can combine these two to a new L, and then your, your U is normalized, and L is not, right? But it doesn't change anything. It doesn't, 
bring any advantage. It's just a different way of doing it, right? And if we do that, then we have to talk about column permutation. It makes it, gives you more headache. That's, <laughs> let's not go that way. It turns out with just row permutation, that's, that's sufficient, necessary and sufficient to factorize any matrix using LU. So you can, a lot of time in math, you have several options. You can just stick to one and then move forward with that convention. Let's see in chat. So Professor Grizel says yes, but it is not a standard in the math literature. So probably most books, if you look into, they don't drive that way. Oops, where were we? Uh, all right, so we, we did this, and can you do it again, right? That's the question. Can I do this repeatedly again and again? Let's see if the same idea works again, right? We go to the second layer of the onion. It's just like, right? Onion that, it's a very bad onion. <laughs> you have to peel each part, layer by layer, right? As a whole, this is a very complicated shape to deal with. You cannot separate it, see what each layer looks like, right? But this is a way of to decomposing the matrix into building blocks. Then we can get an idea of what's going on. So pick the second column, divide by three, pick the second row. Just remember, subtract it from the previous result, right? Not the original M, just the previous result. And you can see that we have successfully generated here We replicated zeros, so that's good. It's not gonna change, it's not gonna ruin the previous step. That's important. On top of that, we're replicating remaining numbers on the second column and row, second rows of the matrix. When you subtract it, again, from a two by two matrix, we're down to a one by one matrix, which is just a number here. And we continue this and the third time. Whatever is the dimensionality of the matrix, we, we keep doing this until we're down to a matrix of all zeros. Let's do it for the third time. Pick the third column from the last result. Divide it by the pivot, which was, we're in the third step. We pick the third element I did on the diagonal. Diagonal of a matrix was all the elements, right? That, ha they, that they have um, same index for row and column. One, one, two, two, three, three, right? At any step, pick the corresponding diagonal element as your pivot. So we do it for the third time and we get a matrix of all zeros, that's when we, you know we're done. Now, if I have something like this, M minus C1 times R1, minus C2 times R2, minus C3 times R3, and the other side is zero, I guess you all agree that I can just move some terms the other side, that should not be a problem. So I, I learned that M actually can be decomposed at 
sum of some columns times rows. And that's a lot looked like um, our second way of matrix multiplication, right? If we had two matrices, right, we wanted to multiply, we said that take the first column of the first one times the first row of the first, second matrix, right? Plus the second column times the second row. Plus the third column times the third row of the second matrix. So it sounds like we could put all the C columns into one matrix and all the R rows into another matrix. And when we do that, by this way of zeroing out, by that puzzle that we, we solved, it gives us an, int an interesting uh, structure that by just stacking those columns that uh, came out of that game of zeroing out matrix, it gives us a lower triangular matrix. All, all the terms above the diagonal are zeros. And when you stack all the rows, we get an upper triangular matrix. So if we do that, then essentially M is, we, we call the first one L, call the second one U. Essentially M, the original matrix is L times U. L is lower triangular and U is an upper triangular. And this is called LU factorization, right? So that's basically the story behind LU factorization. In a lot, of, a lot of linear algebra books and um, lectures, this is, starts with Gaussian elimination. We don't teach that. LU is the generalized version of that. Probably Gauss himself would not teach Gaussian elimination today. So L, LU is the way to go. It generalizes um, those concepts as far as we are concerned to use it in engineering. Okay, so, but of course those are interesting to mathematicians. We, we are a little application oriented here. So I hope this clears out the LU factorization in, we call this in a piazza post I made, let's call it vanilla although it had some onions in it too, today. It's the basic version of LU. No complication, we're not dealing with division by zero, the matrix is a square, and so on. We're gonna talk about um, cases that we might get in trouble and how we deal with that today. Because this is a little simplified. Why do we want, the question is why do we want a full matrix of zeros to call it the end of the game we were playing? Well, because if the other side is zero, I can forever continue by picking a column of zero and a row of zero without normalizing and then subtracting, but that doesn't do anything, right? Besides, if it's zero, the other side is nothing. I, I have reached an e equilibrium. I, I reached this, this result that M is essentially product of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. Without losing anything, this is exact, right? I'm exactly, this equality means that we are not approximating, this is an exact process. Maybe a more satisfying answer is that I have three dimensions, right? That my matrix is three by three. I need to do this three times because last time I'm down to a one dimensional space and once I have zero everywhere, I, what's left is a zero dimensional um, problem which means basically it doesn't exist, right? So a matrix of size K, we need to N by N, we need to repeat this N times to reach zeros. Now how to use LU? We want to solve 
a linear system of equations. That's one motivation to do LU factorization. If I give you A times X equals B, how to solve this system? It is not obvious at all, in general, how to solve this system of linear equations. And we don't want, we, don't, we want a systematic way. We don't want hand calculation for small number of variables. We want something that is scalable. Let's just substitute what we have. Let's, let's see where it goes. So I'm telling you A times X equals B. We, come, we calculate that A is, in fact, can be factored into L and U. Let's substitute A, right? as LU in the equation, right? When we get what we see here, we, have, we haven't done anything. We're just substituting L as LU. Now the trick is to define U, which is a matrix, times X, which is a vector, to be just another vector, right? We learn that matrix times a vector will produce a vector. And we define, we call this y, just, just another vector. Now if I define u times x to be y, then essentially I have l times y equals b, right? Now you already know how to do forward substitution. If l is triangular, uh, lower triangular, with forward substitution, we can solve for y. So we can know what's the value of y. And on top of that, we know u times x equals y. Then y is the right-hand side. We know y is the noun vector at this time. u is an upper triangular matrix. And you already know back substitution. So then we can solve for x. So there are two steps. First, we factorize the matrix. After that, we have to solve a forward substitution to find y. And then we have to solve a back substitution to find x, which is our answer. We are after x. y is just an intermediate step uh, variable that we're using in this problem. So we are breaking the, a hard problem into two relatively easy problems. Can be programmed for any size. Any question for this part? This, this is very important. And I want to make sure we are all comfortable with Solving a linear system of equations if we can factorize the matrix into L and U. Your level of comfort scares me. <laughs> We're seeing a peak in the IQ in <laughs> generation by generation. <laughs> this used to be super hard. <laughs> Nobody would understand it. <laughs> okay, so at any time if you have questions about it, when we go through examples, just please interrupt. Let's talk about it. One example, it's simple, but not trivial necessarily. So if you take a course in, let's say, mechanical engineering, naval architecture, civil engineering, anything related to mechanical concepts, you will take a, you'll, you'll take a course in statics, which deals with analyzing forces and moments. Moments are basically rotational forces acting on structures. Um, when 
the system is and the structure is not moving, it's a static, right? So the goal is to, given the loads, external forces we have, for example, it's a building, you have people, whatever weight is the floor putting on the uh, steel structure here. Given external loads, then the structure that you know, the geometry, we want to analyze whether the system is um, in balance or not. Or to put it the, another way, we want to find out what are the reaction forces based on places we fix this structure if I'm putting this load, right? It's the physics law, right? If I push this point, there's a reaction to it, right? But if I'm putting a very heavy load here, what are, what are the reactions in all other joints? At some point, this structure will break down. And I need to analyze that and design it such that maybe two times, three times is stronger than the maximum force that I'm, I'm willing to design this object to handle. So that's, that's generally a topic of mechanical engineering. And it turns out they'll teach you that, they'll teach you that the condition is that some of the forces along each direction must be zero, and some of the moments will be zero. I'm not going to teach you here. Leave it for them. More than happy to teach you in office hours or on piazza. But what you will learn is that there's something called free body diagram. You draw that. You have all the forces acting on the body. This roller here means that uh, it can move in one direction, but not vertically. And this is your ground, basically. And this pin here, this is, um, that's why we have two forces, because it's completely constrained. Anyway, you do your analysis. That's your engineering training. That's what you're getting paid for. You arrive in these equations. And from here, you should derive a system of linear equations. Here, we have three variables. But when you analyze a structure, this can be very, very large. You have finite element methods when you divide each structure to tiny, tiny pieces, and you're dealing with millions of um, variables at each point to, at each area to, to analyze. But it boils down to a linear system of equations. So it's very good to learn that at that point, you should let uh, linear algebra and um, math languages like Julia or MATLAB do the job for you. The point, I wish somebody would teach us. We, we had to do hand calculation. It was very painful. Nobody taught us that, well, you, you, this is, you need to reach to this part. After this, it's just math, and you can solve it using linear algebra. I think there is an example in the book on electrical circuits that you have KVL, KCL laws for current and voltage. You get similar results. In each engineering discipline, you have similar ideas. Not surprisingly, you have an equivalent physics law for equilibrium. And that usually gives you something like a linear system of equations to solve. So that's the question, right? Uh, with some background, we, we arrive at a linear system of equation. And the goal is finding there's a 100 Newton's force acting on the beam here. And I want to find reaction forces. Well, my problem is reduced to a linear system of equations. I don't have to think about physics anymore. What I'm going to do, I'm, I have a matrix A, and I'm just going to factorize it into L and U. I leave it into your capable hands to fill the gaps, do the calculations, but you, you're going to get L as an identity matrix, matrix, which is best case scenario. The problem is already solved because it's identity. And U is just another upper triangular matrix. 
Now, the steps that we have to follow is that a, a x equals b and a is l u. Therefore, I have l u times x equals b. And I'm going to call u times x equals y. Then, substituting back here, it will give me l times y equals b. First, I will solve for y by forward substitution. And you can always do that, right? Then I will solve for x using back substitution. However, you need to be careful here. If there's any zero on the diagonal of u, you, you won't be able to solve the system because next, next lecture we will see that implies the determinant is zero. There is no unique solution. So be careful if there is a zero on the diagonal of u. For the, for the first part, you can always solve it. Anyway, these are the steps, and we don't have that problem here. So L is the identity. L times y, it is just y. So y is whatever is the right-hand side. That's easy. So we don't actually need um, forward substitution. For the second part, u times x equals y. If you do the back substitution, again, I'll leave it to you. Uh, fill the gaps. This will be your answer, okay? So all your physics knowledge and engineering was in de deriving that linear system of equations. The rest is just a standard math, which a lot of software, engineering software that analyze um, structures or electrical boards, they actually do this stuff for you too. You just need to model it. That's what they do deep down. But not everything is packaged in software. A lot of time robotics, for example, perception problems, we actually implement some of the solvers ourselves. Maybe we want it to be fast, very fast. Then off-the-shelf solvers are not necessarily good. But that's a different story. Okay, so that's just a simple example um, to see that this is useful in, in practice. It's not more than that puzzle we played. Um, Important question, what, when things can go wrong, because we came up with an idea that peeling the onion to break the matrix into L and U, but we don't know if something can go wrong or not. It just, it, it seemed it's working for the examples we tested on. There are actually two cases that we will be in trouble. The first one is when C, the column that you need to pick at that step becomes entirely zero, right? So we, we go to zero out first and second, first column and first row, and then we want to uh, pick the second column next time, and then all of it is zero. This is actually easy to solve. If C becomes all zero, all you need to do, take the case entry and set it to one. Problem solved. Why? I made a piazza post. If you follow the calculation, actually adding that one won't change anything in, in um, that multiplication that should result in the matrix but it will allow us to carry on the calculation. Let's look at an example. M is a three by three matrix. I take the first column divided by pivot, which is two. Take the first row, calculate M minus C times R, I wanted to zero out the first 
column and first row, what happened is that the second column is now all zeros. Now, the reason I cannot carry on, the, the algorithms are stuck, because the pivot is zero. We cannot do division by zero. And the solution is that at step k, the kth pivot then becomes zero. And all the all entire column must be zero, right? If the entire column is zero, then just put the pivot to one. And then carry on. That that will be fine. And then you can do the third time and then that will give you L U factorization. But what's the difference with the case that we did not face this problem? You get a beautiful zero on the diagonal of U and you cannot solve that linear system anymore, right? Now this means the determinant of M is actually zero. Topic of next lecture, but that's the consequence of that. So LU is still possible, even if the matrix is singular, you can solve the LU factorization, but have to be careful what implies if you get zero on the diagonal of U. Now, by the way, do you, can you guess why, could we guess this from the beginning by just looking at M? Is that even possible? Coincidence, but like the second column is just the first column negated and then divided by um, the case um, uh, pivot. Yeah, the question is is it a coincidence that the first column is a factor of the second column, right? Was that your question? Was that your statement? Yeah. yeah so, the first column here is, well, if we multiply this column by negative two, sounds like we can get the first column. So they're not actually independent. So whenever you see two columns are the same up to a factor or two rows are the same up to a factor, that's a sign that you're gonna see something like this because the determinant will be zeros. Why that's um, the topic of linear independence in chapter, I guess, seven future lectures. But there are ways to know that that, that's, that problem exists. But hopefully you can see how these topics are all interconnected and not independent topics. As we move forward, all of them are gathering around the same topic of, I wanna solve a linear system of equations. There are so many things to just think about while I'm doing that. Case two. The first one wasn't too bad. Case two is um, where we generalize. It's a little more involved. It's because C is not all zeros now, but the pivot is zero. Consider a matrix like this. 
we have 0 and 1 on the first row and 1 and 1 on the second row. If you start doing LU, you pick the first column, 0 and 1, divided by the pivot, which is 0. We're stuck already in the first step. What can we do? Looking for ideas. Anything simpler? I don't know what's permutation. <laughs> Anything in layman language? Uh, yeah, how about we switch rows? If I have, let's say, x plus y, I don't know, equal 1. And then I have y, 0, x. Should be the other way. 0x equals 2, whatever. No, it, it shouldn't matter, right? I can just write this x plus y equals 2, 0x plus y equals 1, right? That's not important at all. I can just ch change the order of equations. So I think that's very convincing. We, we know that it doesn't matter what, what order I am writing the equation. That will not change the solution. And the question is that, OK, that's good. We agree on that. But we want to do it in um, the matrix form. Because we're dealing with matrices, we need a way of doing this switching rows um, with matrices. And that's. What you mentioned, it's done via permutation matrices. So it's not actually complicated. We just need to swap rows. We need a way to find out to swap rows whenever we need. And that should um, fix the problem. Because when we swap rows, then we bring a uh, row to the current step that where, where the pivot is not 0, and the problem is solved. Okay. So all we need to do is to permute two rows of our matrix um, at any step, m minus cr, the first step, m itself. But we also need to uh, swap rows of L, because as we permute the original matrix, obviously that should change the um, um, L matrix that we get. You, you can intuitively think, connect to that idea that it shouldn't be the same, because I am changing the rows, then L will be different. So the key idea is to use a permutation matrix. And remember, recall that permutation matrices, we talked about it briefly, that we take an identity matrix of the same size and I want here, I want to change the order of the first row and the second row. So all I need to do is to swap these two rows, and I get my permutation matrix. And this works for any matrix size, right? I could, if you want to refresh, you can go back to previous slides, and there's an example. Uh, you can see there's a vector. We want to switch three and five. And I'm building a 5 by 5 permutation matrix. And all I need to do is just swapping third and fifth row of uh, my identity matrix. Yeah. Good. We're not doing it. You can, you can do it. It's not um, same concept, but you're doing right multiplication and you're swapping columns. Because LU with row permutation covers all cases, it's not necessary to, um, for us to talk about it. It is a nice topic for maybe optional reading or self-study if you want to. Because the key is what not to talk about. 
<laughs> the problem is not what to talk about. <laughs> when we make a course, the question is what to drop. That results in different courses. So our judgment is that row permutation is enough. Professor Grisel says we have LU on asteroid. asteroids. <laughs> Apparently, there's an LDL version of that in the book. All right, so. So what we need to do, we need to multiply our permutation matrix by A. And when we do that, as expected, it will move the first row to the second row and the second row to the first row. Now, instead of factorizing A, we factorize the permuted version of A, which is P times A. Of course, if I permute a and then factorize it, then we have P times A equals LU, okay? Because P times A is just another matrix, and I'm going to factorize that to LU, then P times A equals LU. Now, if you perform the LU factorization, what you will see is that you get LU. L is, here is the identity matrix, and U is an upper triangular matrix. Okay, that's, so given the permutation matrix, right, we can um, resolve that problem. When C is not, the column is not entirely zero and the pivot is zero, okay? That's the solution to that problem. And in the algorithm that uh, is in the book and in the lab we'll cover, we do it as we go forward. It's not like you need to know the entire permutation in the beginning. As we derive the LU step by step, we also perform permutation. And what we do is that we look for the biggest value, largest value in the column, and then we bring that row up to the current step, regardless of whether, um, So regardless of whether pivot is zero or not, you can do that, right? You say that always bring the largest value in that column to the current step. Then that problem is solved. Then if it's all zero and then set it to one. Now the question is, if I have A X equals B and now I have P times A equals L U, how to solve the system? Well, it changes. Um, this is a slightly different. Again, I substitute uh, P times, sorry, I multiply both sides. Of my equation by P and one question is why not like this? Why, why I can't write this like Is this correct? I'm multiplying both sides by P. Order matters. What I'm doing wrong in that order. It should be P, B, Y. 
because matrix multiplication is non-commutative, but I'm also multiplying both sides by P. Where is my mistake? Yes, it's not, but uh, where I'm going wrong that I end up with this result. And it looks silly, but it can happen a lot in practice. So because it's non-commutative, right, uh, I need to choose whether I'm going to multiply from left or right. If I'm going to multiply both sides of a matrix equation from left, then both sides must be multiplied from left. If I'm going to do that from right, then both sides must be multiplied from right. Besides, this doesn't make sense because B is a vector, column vector, P is a matrix, there's a dimension mismatch, but even if we don't have that problem, in this case, because I want to permute A by multiplying from left, I am doing P, A, X, then the right hand side also must be multiplied from left. That's the reason we get P times B, okay? Now, I know it sounds obvious to many of you, but it's an easy mistake to make. And it will be deadly if the dimension makes sense and you can actually multiply matrices, okay? Your result will be completely wrong. So we have P times A times X equals P times B. It sounds like only the right-hand side is changed. I have L times Y equals P times B. So when I permute A, I need to permute the right-hand side, which makes sense because if I'm changing the order of two equations, right? If I'm moving equation two up, right, to be above equation one, then obviously I need to move two as well, right? Otherwise it's just not the same system. I can't leave one here and two here. This is just not correct. So by this logic, when I permute A, I need to permute B as well, okay? So all I'm trying to do is keep the system to be the same by just changing the order. Okay, the, so the rest is the same. I am just permuting A, calculating LU, and then permuting B, and I do the same thing to solve the system. Now you can look at more examples in the book, more hand calculations, there are algorithmic implementations. You see algorithms, that's your first encounter with a serious algorithm that's doing something very, very useful. There's the LU algorithm without row permutation, and there's the LU algorithm with row permutation, where you can try to read the algorithm, ask your questions um, in the lab or piazza. And then in the end, we also have LU for rectangular matrices which is interesting because then, um, for example, U becomes rectangular instead of oh, so square. That B is just another column vector like D. B. It's just numbers, right? B, B. But it's not, we know it's not changing the numbers because P is a permutation. It's just swapping, right?
All right, now we have something a little more interesting. There's a four by four matrix. Compute LU factorization by hand and closed eyes. No, we're not gonna do that. From now on, <laughs> you are free <laughs> to use Julia. Um, all, we, all we have to do, we have to load. Now, we insist you implement your forward and back substitution and play with LU factorization, but the truth is once you know how it works, you use something like this. You load linear algebra, you define your matrix, The method is called LU. You pass your matrix to LU, it will give you an object. It's not giving you L and U, it's an object, right? F dot L will give you L. F dot U, dot means you're calling um, that attribute of that object in programming language. Right? It tells the program to bring the attribute L from object F. Now this LU, unless you tell it don't permute, it will, by default, it will do raw permutations for you. So the default actually in libraries is that permute. No matter what, no matter it's needed or not, it will, um, for reasons that to make the factorization numerically stable, it will bring the biggest uh, pivot up, right? Because the last thing you want is the dividing by a very tiny value in your numerical algorithm. So we actually, we're dealing with, by default, we're dealing with permutation matrix times M here, our matrix equals LU. So if you really want to check if the LU is correct, you say L times U, two equality sign to question whether it's e both sides are equal or not, then permutation matrix times M, right? And it's telling you true. So it's not telling you every element is, is the same on both sides of these four by four matrices. It's just telling you that two matrices are the same, true. Which, by the way, if you want to check your hand calculations, you can always use Julia. But even for a four by four matrix, I think it will be too long to write down by hand. So you can also print L, U, and P. As expected, L is lower triangular. U is upper triangular. But you can see now the numbers are not the whole numbers. Last lecture, um, you were asking, why do you use really nice examples <laughs> when four divided by two give you two? <laughs> Make it nasty. I want to see floating num point numbers. So that will make uh, my slides ugly, so I refuse to do that. <laughs> but I give you Julia examples with floating point numbers. So it's not a problem. It can be, it's a float number. It can be anything, any real number. P, can you tell what happened inside the algorithm by looking at this permutation matrix. This is a good exercise. This is related to the topic of next lecture, the inverse of a matrix and inverse of a permutation matrix. So here is a way to, I, I think about it. What would take me to the identity matrix, right? 
That's the path we came. If I figure it out, that will tell me what happened. Is that a reasonable proposal? Right? So, 4 by 4 identity matrix is, of course, like this. Now, this one is in place. The first row is the first row. This is not. This is also not. The fourth row is also correct. So it sounds like there was a row swap between second and the third row inside the algorithm as it was computing the LU factorization. So we, we can tell that actually by looking at the permutation matrix. Then people use linear algebra and artificial intelligence will tell you this is explainable AI. <laughs> you can impress people because you know what's going on. So is it, is, is it clear here? You will practice more in, in the lab session and your Julia programming um, homeworks. Another example here we, now we want to solve a system of linear equations. It's four by four, we have four variables and we want to solve this. What should we do? Uh, yeah, how about <laughs> how was it? We do the factorization by hand? Are you <laughs> volunteering to do that? <laughs> We have a volunteer to do a hand calculation here. Um, we can, but it's, it, gets, it's, it gets tedious for four by four matrix. This slide um, is the current state of science and engineering. We are actually solving the system as well, um, using a really, really compact notation that I will explain. You're not supposed to do that as far as I know in your homework, but it's good to know. You can also verify your solution. So we define our matrix A, which is just what we had. We had A, X equals B. So I need to define A and B. Then I calculate LU as before. The solution is in an object, I call it F. What am I doing here? You can read the comment, but let's make sense of the notation and here. So first I'm solving for y, that was, the, the, that, that was part of the steps we need to follow. First solve for y using forward substitution. Then solve for x using back substitution. Very important. I need to permute b because LU here is only permuting the matrix for me. It's not managing the right-hand side of the equation for me. So I need to permute B. Not very difficult, just P times B. 
So we have L Y equals P B. And I am writing here Y is L backslash P times B, let's call it D, right? It's going to be another vector. So this is important enough that there's a symbol for it, backslash. It's the same in MATLAB. So when you use backslash, Julia is doing it for you. It's, it's actually doing the um, forward substitution for you and giving you y. Now you, you have a function. You write a function. You have an algorithm to do it yourself, right? Because we insist on that so you, you can know what's inside. But when you're dealing with real projects, all you need to do using this backslash, and it's solved. It's very clean. Now given y, we know that u x equals y, x u backslash y. Use the same symbol for Back substitution. In fact, you can try to use x equals a backslash b. It will do everything for you. MATLAB will do all the factorization, back forward substitution, back substitution, it should give you the solution. But I'm trying to walk you through the steps here. Now, this is like your superpower. You're not supposed to use it in your homework. We're not going to give you grades if you do it. <laughs> but you can test your answers to check your forward substitution or back substitution algorithms are correct or not. How do we know this is correct? Well, two sides must be the same. A times x minus b must be a vector of zeros. And this is almost zero. This is up to machine precision uh, that we're doing here. So when you see not re really tiny numbers like this, that's just basically zero. Right? It's not mathematically zero. It's numerically zero. OK, so this is my last slide, but questions here? Backslash D. If there was, would that be the same as like D forward slash L? Say it again. If D is forward slash? Like, is, is L backslash D the same as D forward slash L? Oh, no. You're saying if this is the same thing, right? You're saying if. It is not. Well, in, in a normal setting, this, the right answer doesn't make sense at all. That's a division, right? That's a division symbol. Now, in some programs like MATLAB, possibly Julia, they'll think that maybe you mean the inverse of <laughs> something that is in the bottom right, uh, in the, in the um, denominator, but I mean, D is a vector. It's not inverse is defined for square matrices. Next time we'll see. Not the same. Absolutely not the same. So be careful. Backslash is very different from slash. Now, I'm not supposed to talk about inverses here, but this is related to that. But we never explicitly invert a matrix. That's Something to avoid at all costs. Any other question about this lecture, any part of it?
Feeling good about LU, even with permutation? Okay, so well, that's all I have today. This is about LU factorization. Next time, I'm going to talk about determinants, matrix inverses, matrix transpose. Things get a little more interesting. And we will see the same LU can help us to actually calculate um, determinants. You can also do inverses. I try to include an example for that as well, although that might be a little um, extra, but it's fun to see. So the topic is in chapter six. If you can take a look at chapter six before the lecture, that will be great. And see you on Wednesday.